example where that incorporate a lot of the stuff that we've done since the beginning of uh, class and some of the newer concepts like an object reference and um, constructors. So we created a basketball uh, player class and the basketball class player class had a few attributes such as a name, how many free throws, how many two-point baskets, how many three-point baskets, and then we had a method on them to calculate the number of points. And we said in our hypothetical case that it might be that um, we would want to, uh, we would know after the fact how many points the player had, like if we were doing a summary after the game and we were simply recording it into an application. In which case we create a constructor that would create the class and also um, instantiate the, or set those variables. Uh, we also said that, that another thing that we could have is we could have a case where we had a little mobile app, for example, that we had buttons that for each player we could click on when they scored a free throw, field goal, or three point shot and it would automatically increment there, but that by one, and so on. We talked about some good things that we could add, for example, to correct that if it was wrong, if you, if you hit the wrong player or whatever, but again, we're, we're, we're not going into business making one of these apps, so we don't have to worry about the, this is the nice thing about teaching, we don't have to worry about dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's, but it should be pretty straightforward how to do that. Let's take a look at the basketball class and take a look at the test class we had and then um, go from there. So, our basketball player class looks like this. We have three attributes, I'm sorry, four attributes. The name of the player, free throws, field goals, and three-point shots. It does not make any sense to have a player without a name. Therefore, we are requiring that when a new player is created, that a name is supplied. We've created two constructors. One of the constructors is a constructor that accepts only a name, and it defaults the other values to zero. The other constructor is a constructor that accepts the player's name and accepts values for each of the three other attributes the free throws, field goals, and so on. Keep in mind, and one thing that I, I saw a couple examples of, keep in mind that a constructor is not like a regular method. All right, it kind of looks like a method in coding, but it's not really a method. But one thing, a constructor never has a return value. So our other methods say public int, public void, and so on. But in our case, the constructors simply say public and the name of the class. That's the second thing that you might note, is that the name of the constructor is going to be the name of the class. So in this case, my class is called BB Player, so the constructor is public BB Player. Now, we can have as many constructors as we want, as long as they differ in terms of the number and or type of arguments they have. That way the compiler can keep it sorted, hey, I'm calling this constructor and I'm passing a, uh, it one string, this must be the constructor that the user wants, because that's the only constructor that accepts one string as an argument. We couldn't define a second constructor to like set the player's hometown um, that accepted one string because again the compiler would get confused and not know which one you wanted so I could not have another constructor that accepted one string could have an, a constructor that accepted two strings the player's name and hometown but I couldn't have one that just accepted the hometown. Now I realize in this case that's kind of a, a bogus example. You, you know, why would you set the player's hometown without the name? But again, it somehow has to, ch you know, somehow has to, the, the signature, the arguments of the function, of the constructors have to be different one way or another. 
As is often the case in the, in, with constructors, you'll see that we set some properties and we default other properties to default values. Um, keep in mind that given that we've defined a constructor, the compiler thinks that we know what we're doing as far as constructors go. So it will not generate a no argument constructor. In previous classes, before we talked about constructors, we were creating objects and we were calling a constructor, but it was a constructor that the compiler generated automatically for us. The no argument doesn't default anything, just allocates some memory. Any questions about the constructors? So again, me as, crea as a creator of this class is providing the coders that are going to be using my class a couple of options on how to create a player. Create a player with no points, create a player where you already know all the points that they've scored. And then whoever's coding the code to use my object or use my class can then use whichever method is convenient to them. So you notice in a lot of classes you'll see a whole bunch of constructors. All right, and it's like, well, depends on what the, the user has, the, the, the coder has that's using your class, what will be supplied. Get total points simply takes the free throws plus two times the field goals plus three times the three point shots and returns that total. Score free throws, score field goal, and score three points simply have um, increment the values of those um, pointers. Those, those point values. I could do this a different way though. All right. I could, instead of storing a number of three point shots, field goals, and free throws, I could just store the total number of the points. All right. So if they scored a free throw, increment the number of points by three. Why might this be a better approach to store the individual components? In case you need them individual, remember, you can always take detail and sum it up to get a total. If all you have is a total, you can't take the total and break it down into its parts unless you have some additional information. So generally speaking, we're storing the detail, we're summing up. That would be like, again, as a student. As a student, they store your individual grades for each class. Then they calculate the GPA. They wouldn't have to do it that way. They could store your GPA and every time you get a new grade they could recalculate your GPA. But then you would not be able to show a transcript that showed each individual class in its grade. So it's better to have the detailed information that you can sum up. Now, one of the concepts though of, of object-oriented uh, programming is data hiding. Um, and if I were to give this class to someone, they wouldn't necessarily know what the innards of the class is. I might be storing total points. All right. They don't need to know what we're storing inside the class. They just need to know the methods that are public. Now they might be able to like figure it out, like, gee, I can ask how many free throws did you make in this game? Well, they must be storing a number of free throws somewhere. But again, the idea of data hiding is that that kind of thing is, is a black box to the user. The user, just, or the user programmer just needs to know like what are the proper methods to call. All right, let's say I want to make a team now. What attributes would be on the team? Let's talk about the team class. What are we going to put in the team class? Okay, uh, and how are we going to accomplish that? All right, we're probably going to have an array list of players. Now this is one case where you might even be able to get away with an array because there is a finite number of players that are allowed to be on a basketball team. But I still would use an array list anyhow. So we're going to have an array list for the players. What else are we going to have? Right. 
in terms of attributes, we're probably going to have the, te the, the team's name. But then we're going to have get total points. Maybe get points for a player. Who had the top points? Get top score. And we'll leave it at that. All right. I actually thought of this on the way down the class today. We are going to be nice to ourselves and assume that no one is going to be tied for the leading score. We're going to assume that there's one leading score. Not that it would be that difficult, but I don't, I don't feel like talking about that today. All right, so that's the great luxury of being a teacher, right? It's like, oh, I just don't want to talk about it. Well, it's not a matter of an easy day. It's a matter of I want to, there's things I want to cover, and that's not one of them. All right, and yes, I do deserve an a, a day, a easy day today. Now, what arguments could we have? What, or I'm sorry, not what arguments. What constructors could we have on the team? Okay. So, we could probably do this a couple different ways. I'm going to first of all that we're going to have a constructor that accepts the team name and just the team name. I could have a constructor that accepts a team name and an array list of players. The one method that we forgot is we forgot to have a method to add a player to a team. We're not going to subtract any. Once you're, once you're on, you're on for life. <laughs> All right. So we're going to start out and we're going to, we're going to follow the spirit that I've done all these examples in and that is to do a bit at a time. Don't try to hit a home run, but just try to chip away at the problem until you're done with it. Again, so many advantages to doing that. It's a better way to code and I think it's better for your, your peace of mind and your, and your attitude to... to uh, pardon me? Your self-esteem goes up, right. Because it's like, instead of being, you know... Um, Instead of being done, it's a better feeling to be 100% done with 70% of the stuff you have to do than to be 70% done of 100% of the stuff that you have to do. In both cases, our hypothetical completion is the same. But in one, there's seven out of ten items we can check off our list and say we are done with that works and I know it does. Or in the other one, we haven't really finished anything yet. All right, everything's out is a loose end. So I'm going to go and I'm going to create the team class and um, we'll go from there. All right, and we'll see how far we get today. Um, I want to finish up this example this week and I also want to talk about inheritance this week. So those are our two big topics for, for today. If we finish up this one today, then that will give us um, Wednesday for inheritance. Anyhow, so I'm going to make a class. Public class team. Pardon me? Public class team. And I'm going to create a constructor for team. So what will that be? Public. Again. Oh, I forgot to create the attributes by mistake. Let's do that first. String. Team name. Yes, they should. I am going to need to look this one up. I always need to look to, uh, up how to declare an array list of objects. I 
I looked it up. Got to put it there too. What word thingy? Oh, the import, yeah. And again, that weird thingy is an import statement. And the idea of an import statement is that we have to tell the compiler where to find, what, what do we mean by an array list? All right. Um, and in order to do that, we have to point to where the array list lives. So the array list lives as part of this package. So I could do that, or I could say array list. Yep. All right. So now I'm going to, it's time for me to create our constructors. I'm going to start simple. And I'm going to create a constructor. Oh, I got to put these guys as private too. Yep. We don't want that. The idea of this, again, is that when we talk about users or other people, we're talking about other programmers. But still, you know, you want to make sure that they don't do things that you don't want them to do as a creator of the object. All right? As a creator of the class, you know how the object works. You're defining everything. You're encapsulating everything. And yes, people have to be able to manipulate it. But you are controlling how they manipulate it by setting the public methods. The public methods are your way of, they even say, use the term, exposing, exposing the pieces, the interfaces, the, the, the functions of the objects, the methods that you want other programmers to use. <laughs> so, therefore, if you want users to be able to do such and such, you give them a method to do that. That way you can put code in to validate it, whatever. You're doing it on their terms as opposed to making all your attributes private where they can manipulate those, them however you want to or however they want to. So I'm going to say public team. I'm going to accept the string argument. And I'm going to simply set the team name to arg name. Now these are just names that I have given, team name, arg name, and all that. By convention, I typically call my arguments arg, just so that I know that they're arguments. And team is what's called an instance variable. It is uh, it's an instance variable because every object of this class has its own value for it. All right. It's also, uh, uh, what do I want to say? Oh, it's available throughout the whole class. So if I write any method I want to, I can access that. So let's write a, a little simple one to. All right, I'm going to write a method that returns the team name. So later on, we can ask, gee, who was that team again? Again, we can do this because this is an instance variable. It lives through the whole class. Anywhere in the class can do that. Let's create a, a, a um, a um, method to add a player. It doesn't return anything. What's going to be the argument to this? Pardon me? It's going to be a, it's going to be a player. All right. Now again, this is where a lot of students get confused because they think, well, 
Is it going to be like the name of the player? No. We have a component that does everything we ever need to do with a player. Therefore, if we want to add a player somewhere, we're not going to take like just the player's name or this or that. We're going to take and going to add the player component. All right. So the argument of this is going to be a BB player. I'll give it the name of our player, and then. When I go in and say it, what I do is players add arg player, and I think that is correct. But again, I'm going to review array lists. Yeah, it looks like array list add will do it for me. Now. One thing that we may or may not do, depending on time, but all these things that I say we may or may not do depending on times would be good exercises for you to try if we don't do them together in class. But one thing I could do is, there's a rule about how many players can be on a team, right? There's, for example, I think it's like 12 players on a typical basketball team. I could have validation in here that returned a false if I tried to add a 13th player. So before I add a new player, I could look to see how many players are in the array list. And if there were already 12, then I would not allow them and I would return a false. And, or I could return a true to indicate that yes, a player was added. We could do a similar thing with exceptions as well, but we haven't talked about exceptions yet. So again, because we're controlling the way that other classes access that list of players, we can put that validation in there. If we simply gave them access to that player list, they could add a million players if they wanted to, and there's nothing we could do about it. Okay? So, if we have time, we'll go and, and maybe we'll try that. Yes? No, go It is, well, it is, and again, keep in mind, we're developing a component, and the more flexible we make the component, the better it is. So, for example, we might want to have a set method that, expect, that accepted an entire array list of players and set the array list to that, or we might do that via the constructor. So, it's okay to provide a couple of different ways to add players to the list. So. Yeah, we would do that wherever wherever we were adding players. We could we could, um, you know, we could have some sort of logic to do that, or we could have that logic call this method or whatever. All right, I'm going to do one more method here, and that will be to give me the total points that the team has. All right, so what is that method going to look like? Public. It's going to return an integer, right? What is this function going to look like? All right. In other words, if you were doing this, if you were doing this by hand, if, if you didn't, if you weren't a computer program, but, but someone just gave you a list of score sheets that said what the players did, what would you do? You would start off with your calculator, you're doing it with a calculator. You start with your calculator equals zero. See, so first player got 10 points, 10, plus second player got 12 points, 12, and all that. You'd look at them, you look at the players one at a time, you'd get their point table uh, total off of their little score sheet, and then you'd add it to the running total. All right, and then when you're all done, your running total will be the total that the team had. So we're going to make an integer for total. Then I'm going to say for int i equals zero. I'm going to start off i equal to zero. All right, this is cl a classic, you know, you'll see this all the time, array processing. Because what does an array's index, an array or an array list index does? It starts at zero. And then it, you iterate one time, you iterate your counter one time through the loop, and each time through the loop you're looking at the next member of that list. So 
How long do we want to continue doing this? Well, as long as there's people in the list. All right? So what would the expression be? Well, I is less than what? Players dot size, I think. And again, what do you mean? Do array lists have a for each thing? Yeah, yeah, you can. Um, you can do it for arrays. Uh, um, well, that's a good question. I'm not sure if you can do that with array lists or not. But you definitely can do this. That is, uh, you know, that is my absolute uh, favorite thing to hear in this class, uh, what, what you can do in C-sharp. Right. Uh, well, well, yeah, but, but you know, what is, what, what's, the, what's the phrase that devil's in the details? So A, I'm not sure that that's the case that you can't change anything, or I, I, I don't know. I'd have to see that statement written down. But the bottom line is that that doesn't really matter. All right. The question is, is what are we going to do here? And here we're going to go and we're going to loop through. As long as i is less than the size of the array list. Right. Okay. So we're going to loop through. And then I'm going to do what? I'm going to grab a player. All right. So how do I grab an element from an array list? Well, let's just bring up the Java docs for array list. And we can verify a couple things. We can see, first of all, that size is the number of elements in the list. <coughs> and to get this, we have a number of choices. Um, one of them is to get and we can give an index. All right. So in this case, our index is that i variable. So each time through, we can say student s equals player. Student is <laughs> a college basketball team, all right? BB player p equals players get i. Why is there no new in that statement? In the past when we said bb player p, we've said equals new something. Right. Because we're not creating a new player object. Or those player objects already exist. They've been created somewhere else. They got put in this team's player list. So we're not creating a new player. We're simply looking at each one in turn. So how many elements, how many players does the team have? The player size method gives you that. Now here's the cool thing. Because the counting starts with zero, we go as long as i is less than the player size. Because for a 12 t uh, player team, we want i to go from zero to 11. Once it is 12, that would be the 13th player. So we're done. All right. So we're going to go and do that, and then we're going to say total equals what? Total plus, well, what's the name of our student, our, our player, P, and what's the method to calculate total points? And we don't have that anymore. We have to open it up. Yeah, the player points. How do we calculate? Get to 
total points. Then when we're done, we return the total. Repeat that, please. We're doing it on a different object, though. So it's not calling the teams get total points. It's getting the players get total points. Right? In other words, what is the total points for the team? The total points of the team is the sum of total points for each player. And that's what this expression does. On the, in the team class, our method to calculate the total points is to look at each player and sum up each player's total points. Yeah, but the object P Right. Well, I don't have two get total points in, in one class. I have a get total points method here that calls a get total points method in the other class. This is a team class that's calling the one in the player class. Okay. It, it's kind of like with the pizzas. Now, I might have called them different names in pizzas, but what's the, what's the amount of a pizza order? Is the sum of the amounts of each pizza's cost. So the order's cost is the sum of, of that. Now, it's a different name. Get team points, get team total points, or whatever. Um, Whatever you think is clear, whatever would make it clear for you is, is, the, is the way to go. Because they are, I mean, they're different methods. They're different methods doing different things. You can make the argument because it's like, well, what is the team's points? The team's points is simply the sum of for each player. So in a way, it makes sense for me to have the same method because to calculate the total points for the team, that's just like calculating the total points for each player and just adding them together. Okay. So, let's go and test this. All right. So, I'm going to go save this in my Monday folder. I'm going to call it team.java. Now, let's go to my unit test. My unit test, I can keep that part the same, right? Player one or player two. Or I can get rid of that if I want. And now we're testing the team. Whichever one we wanted to do, we, we could do that. I'm going to go and create my team object. So I can say team T equals new team. Now, would this work? No, because we only have one constructor for this. We've defined a constructor, so we no longer get the zero argument constructor. So we have to supply a team name for that. All right. Let's say P1 and P2 are two players on the Cavs team. What would I do to associate them with this team? Then, if I want to print out the total points, I could say
like that. All right. Let's go and save this and run this and, and make sure that it works the way that I suspect it does. All right, well, let's debug. BB players, what's wrong with this picture? I'm, I'm going to pretend I don't know. I actually do know, believe it or not. This isn't just a, a, a joke. That's correct. No, we did put that in there. But if we didn't put in there, it wouldn't complain about BB players. It would complain about array list. So the error would reference that. In fact, let's go and do that so you see the error. If we forgot that, then it tells us it doesn't know what array list is also. Here it just told us it doesn't know what BB players is because it's actually BB player. And that is in the team. I did it right two times, I did it wrong two times. Yeah. All right. Variable total may not have been initialized, okay? In my class, I did not say t equals zero. Again, you and I both know that it's going to make it all the way through, but it doesn't know, the compiler doesn't know that. We could possibly have a team without any players in it. All right. All right, so it compiled. And how many points should they have? So someone got one of each, so that's six points. This person got nine, eight, seventeen. No, that's six. Seventeen, right? Because that'd be eight. And four is twelve. No, this would be eight and six. Fourteen plus three is seventeen. So seventeen plus six, it should say twenty-three points. So Cavs scored, scored 23. Yay. All right. Questions about what we've done so far? Let's say we want to, to, to say who the high score was. Let's write a method that says who's the high score. 
all right? What could that rest, what should that method return? This is one of those fortunate questions that we could probably make a number of answers, but yeah, who? Okay? Player object, that's a legit answer. What's another legit answer? We could return the, the, the player's name. So we could either return a string or we could return a player. Now, Overloading doesn't work with return values, right? Because the way overloading works is that, you, you know, the compiler has to know which method you're calling. And you can't tell which method you're calling by the return values. So we would have to say, we could make two methods in this case. One that would say get player and one that would say get player name. So the get player name could return a string that would have that. And the player, get player, could return the player. So let's go on and so let's write that method to return the high scoring player. <coughs> First what I'm going to do is I'm going to do get high score player. Now, what's that going to return? A BB player. We have a little bit of a tricky situation here, right? Because what are we going to do? We're going to look to see if the player has more points than the previous high points. Well, let's, let's write it. Let's, let's write problems naturally. So let's write this the way that I'd want to. So I have a total of zero, and I can say, loop through, if I didn't want to do that. If p dot get total points is greater than total, what do we want to do? H equals Right, the pointer to the yeah. player that we were looking at. Yes. Thanks for thanks for the spoiler alert there. All right. Yeah. It is going to yell at us. That's yeah. I I I wanted to show that problem. That's that's why I said we're going to let the problem. That's okay. That's okay. I I'm happy that you're thinking and you understand that. Okay. And then when I'm done, I could return H, because H is the player with the highest points. All right. Now again, notice that a return value can return one of something. This is returning one player. All right. That player has all the attributes and methods associated with the player. So I can ask, if I get that player, I can then ask, gee, you know, what is your... Um, you know, what, what was your, how many points did you have? What's your name? So on. What college did you go to? Pardon me? What? Oh, okay. All right. So let's go and compile this. And to the surprise of everyone in the room but two people, we get an error. H might not have been initialized. That's exactly what, what, 
um, you were describing, Brittany was describing. So the problem is, is what do I do with H? H right now is not pointing to anything. If no one scored more than zero points, then I'm going to be returning an empty object. And therefore, H is not initialized. We got a problem. So Brittany's suggestion was a good one. What I could do is I could set the first player to the high, you know, if I was looking through a list of things like, okay, the highest score is the top guy on the list. He had two. Okay, what did the next guy have? So I could say BB player H equals players one get zero, the first player on the list. I could then say total equals what? H that get total point. I can now. Now I can say I can get rid of that variable. Good point. Let's do it. Let's get this working and then we'll go back and do that. All right. So I'm grabbing the total and I'm looping through and I'm seeing if anyone has greater than that total then they become the high point score. Can I change this loop at all? I actually can. I can change one tiny thing about the loop. I no longer need, I no longer need to look at the first player because the first player I'm assuming is the high score. So I could start looking at player one. All right. So let's go in, let's save this. And let's go into our unit test. And I could say BB player M equals team get high score player I could then do a system out blah 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 to output the name of the highest scoring player, which would be M dot get name, so I'll go and add that method real quick. All right, let's compile and run it. And we probably should save it too. To save everything. Player two scored seventeen, and he is the highest score. Now you should test this for a variety of conditions. This is not, you know, we don't get to congratulate ourselves and don't strain your shoulder, pat yourself on the back and all that kind of stuff. We should test for other scenarios to make sure that this works. Right, you should do more rigorous testing for this. This does have the flaw that if the 
If there are two people with the same number of points, it says that the first one's the highest score. Pardon me? It, it, yeah, if they all have zero, yeah. Uh, yeah. So again, so yeah, this could be, this could be changed. Um, we could put validation in here to ensure that um, they don't have more than a certain number of players. We also could put validation in here to make sure we don't add the same player to the team twice. Right? Because what would keep us from saying t dot add player p1 again? Nothing. And now then that array list would contain three object pointers, two of them pointing to the same guy. All right? Well, we could write validation code for that and, uh, and catch that. All right? Now to Mark's point, yeah, we can simplify this and we can avoid having this variable simply by doing this. And we set the high, highest scoring player to the first player. Then we compare the total points, the points of the player with the points of the high scoring player. And then if it's greater than, we do that. And we should be in the same situation. All right. Questions about this? Good exercises would be this. Try to write code that would keep you from adding the same player twice. I'll give you a hint. That code's easier than you might think. All right. Check to see what functions are available on the array list. Also, make sure you can't add more than a certain number of players. You know, for testing purposes, make it simple and say you can't add more than two players if you want to test two on two basketball or whatever. But right now, we could add as many players as we wanted, and we could actually add the same players several times. All right? And neither of those things are good. Well, we could easily re rewrite that method, that add player method, to validate for those two things. And by easily, I mean a couple lines of code, not a whole bunch of lines of code. So that would be a good exercise to take this and try to do that and have it return a true if it works, a false if it doesn't work, if the false if it doesn't add the player. Again, the, the, the reason that I'm emphasizing this, and, and we can talk about this next time some, I'm not sure if I want to go over it in class time, but we can discuss it maybe a bit, is that because we've made that array list private, the only way you can add a player to the team is through our method, which is good, because we can put that validation in the one place to make sure that you know, we don't have five LeBrons out on the floor, which we'd love to have, but unfortunately is impossible. All right. Or that you have 16 players on your team when only 12 is allowed. So by making the attributes private, we keep other programs from using our objects in a way that they should not be used. All right? And uh, we control the accessing and manipulating of those objects. And therefore, we can, we can put validation code in one place, and then no one could add the same player twice to that list. So we'll, we'll at least talk about that a little bit on Wednesday. I don't know if we'll do it or not, but that would be a good exercise between now and then. And then we'll get into inheritance, which is a real important concept. All right, we'll see you up.